Okay, welcome to the third and final video of our energy storage lecture. We're going to talk about batteries. We just talked about pumped hydro storage and how it is the best way to store energy and to extract that energy. However, it um, requires some very specific locations, and so we probably will run out of places to do it before we run out of, before we meet the current demand for power. So, we need a different way, and the up and coming most popular way of storing energy is one that you're probably using right now, a battery. A battery, in the most basic sense of the word, is a technology that converts chemical energy directly into electrical energy. Okay, there, this kind of probably sounds familiar. It seems like we've written this before, right? So there's combustion. But you say, hey, wait a second, in a power plant, we convert chemical energy into electrical energy. And I say, yes, but with combustion, there's something in between. We convert chemical energy into thermal energy by burning. Sorry, I was interrupted. So chemical energy in a power plant is converted into thermal energy through combustion, which is then converted into electrical energy okay so yes batteries direct conversion there are two kinds there is what's called a primary cell a primary cell battery is one where generally what we call the electrochemical conversion so the conversion of chemical energy into electrical energy is not reversible. So it is not rechargeable. This is a one-time use battery like a Duracell you buy at Walmart. A secondary cell, you guessed it, is an electrochemical conversion that is reversible. So we can actually run the process in reverse and convert electrical energy back into chemical energy. And we then have a cycle we can repeat over and over and over. Not for an infinite number of cycles, the second law makes sure nothing works that way, uh, but instead for a large number of cycles. Okay, to get how batteries work, we first need to define some terminology. I gotta admit, I don't necessarily love the terminology here. Um, I'm not a chemical engineer, and so some of these things bring back haunting memories of sophomore year in high school. But here we are. So ions. An ion is any molecule or atom that has a net positive or negative charge. So the number of electrons and protons are imbalanced and there is either positive or negative charge on the entire nucleus electron cloud assembly. Uh, we've created words to describe specific ions where an anion is an ion that has a net negative charge and a cation is one that has a net positive charge. I still remember studying for this my sophomore year, and the best way to remember this is a cation has a T in it, which looks like a plus positive. Cation positive. Okay. In electrolyte, you might have heard of because Gatorade has electrolytes, is a substance, generally a powder or a liquid where ions can flow freely or where they can move through the substance. Um, so this uh, essentially allows a pathway for ions to pass through, generally to convert some sort of reaction, um, the reaction we're about to talk about. First, there are two processes we have to understand. Number one, oxidation. Oxidation is when a molecule or atom in a process experiences the loss of an electron. This is why I hate these terms. What does oxidation have to do with losing an electron? I'm sure there's history here. 
um, it has to do with oxidation number, actually, which is the net charge of any molecule once you remove it from all of its connections to other molecules. Uh, but why we call that an oxidation number? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Okay, oxidation is um, any process resulting in the loss of an, el an electron. Contrast this to a reduction reaction. So an oxidation reaction and a reduction reaction, which is the gain of an electron. And you guessed it, these two go hand in hand. If you have an oxidation reaction, you might get a reduction one because there's now a loose uh, electron. And the combination of these two is called a redox reaction. Which is again a reduction oxidation reaction. Where, so that's essentially a reaction where electrons are exchanged. And exchanged is the key word here. They're not shared, but they are exchanged. So as you exchange them, um, then you end up with an one ion that has a positive charge and another ion that has a negative charge and they are attracted to each other. Um, before the redox reaction, there was an electron here that was moved over to the other, creating an ion, one with a positive charge, one with a negative. They are now attracted to each other. That is a redox reaction. And redox reactions are the key operational principle of batteries. So let's talk about the operation of a primary cell battery. Okay, so we're gonna put this in blue. Really, and the first battery, uh, de which was demonstrated by Volta in Italy, is just two dissimilar metals, so two different metals, uh, which we have separated from each other by an electrolyte. Okay, so let's just draw a standard double A and see what's going on. So here's the outer casing. Turns out that's a part of the battery, an important part. And then we've got the bottom and this thing here. We're going to color each of these according to what they are. Okay, so this outermost casing, which is going to be made out of some metal, in this case maybe zinc, is our positive electrode. Okay, this is a metal that wants electrons. It's asking for electrons so it can be in a more stable state. Now, very close to it is a separate metal. Remember, two dissimilar metals. By dissimilar, we mean that one, the positive electrode, is a metal that wants electrons. And then close to it is a negative electrode or, oh dear, a metal that wants to get rid of, to give up electrons. Okay, so you see we've got kind of these two things, one that wants something, one that wants to get rid of that same thing, and they are close. But there's a problem. They are separated by this electrolyte. And for most batteries, this electrolyte prevents the flow of electrons. But it does allow for ions to flow. Okay, so we've got this potential. Think of this as a big box of potential, right? We have something here that wants to get rid, that wants electrons, and something that wants to give it those electrons, but there is no path 
that they can use to exchange those electrons. All right, so let's give them a path. Let's redraw our battery real quick. Okay, so we've got, here is our positive electrode. It wants electrons. Here's our negative electrode, really wants to get rid of them. Here is our electrolyte. Okay, we are going to connect these two ends through some sort of load with a conducting wire. Now, when we do that, some things start to happen, right? Now that there is a pathway for electrons to move, we experience a redox reaction. Remember, a redox reaction is one where electrons are exchanged and we end up with ions. So this redox reaction causes electrons plus cations to be generated. Again, we're speaking generically. Many batteries have different chemistries. I'm just kind of showing example chemistry. Okay, so we've generated some electrons and some cations. I'll draw electrons as blue circles. Before, these might have been generated, but they had nowhere to go, so the reaction would not continue because these excess electrons are there and they can't move, right? But now that we've generated a pathway, these electrons will move. This resistor will consume some of the power carried by those electrons, and they then arrive at the positive electrode. So here on a battery, this is the positive end, and here is our negative end, okay? Now, when we uh, generated these electrons, we also generated some ions. And now this is where the electrolyte comes in. The electrolyte allows those ions to flow through it, migrating towards the positive end, where they are reunited with the electrons. And then we have a separate reaction here where the electrons plus the cations participate in what we will just call other reactions. And this happens at the positive electrode. Okay, now this, remember, was a primary cell. And it's a primary cell because you see how we are fundamentally changing the chemistry of the battery. These redox reactions are happening, separating electrons and cations, which then migrate away. Those electrons go somewhere else, are here, and we now have something new here and something new here. And even if we power it the opposite way, if we get rid of now this resistor and instead create um, a voltage supply which we put across this thing we won't be able to make the reaction go in reverse however secondary batteries allow us to run reactions in reverse and to once again charge a battery so let's talk about the most popular secondary battery the lithium ion battery Okay, so this, like I just said, is a reversible reaction. We can, um, we have an, a battery initially with a charge across it. We can dispel that charge by running the electrons through a resistance, or we can put a power supply across our battery and recharge our battery so that it once again has a, has a voltage potential across it. So let's look at the construction of a lithium ion battery and then talk about how it works. Okay, so uh, just like before, we have, oh, let me draw one other thing. We have a positive and a negative electrode. So I'm going to draw our positive electrode just kind of like 
this. So this is our positive electrode. And now that we're talking about a specific battery, we can talk about specific materials. In this case, this is a lithium metal oxide. A crystal structure of lithium um, combined with other things including cobalt. Okay, and this is where the lithium wants to be. Lithium is stable here in this nice crystal structure. That's where it wants to be. On the other side of the battery, we have another structure. This is our negative electrode. And it is made out of graphite or just a nice structured carbon. Okay, and the deal with this is lithium can be here. So the way the carbon is, whoops, it can store lithium. Um, however, the lithium doesn't want to be there. It is unstable. There is a voltage potential and it wants that potential to go away. Okay. Um, now it would do that if this wasn't in the way. The membrane. Which like the electrolyte prevents the flow of electrons. Okay. Now there's one more important detail here. We also have an electrolyte still. So here's our electrolyte, which is actually some sort of carbonate with lithium. And what this does is allow lithium ions to flow. So lithium ions can flow freely through this electrolyte and lithium ions can pass through the membrane. Okay, so here are all the parts of a lithium ion battery. Uh, let's talk a little bit about exactly how it works. So we'll have to draw this again, that's all right. Okay, here we have our two different structures. Remember, lithium wants to be on the left. Okay, so I'm going to draw this lithium ion battery in a charged state. So we've got lithium ions that are trapped in this graphite structure where they are somewhat stable but they could be happier. Imagine it like you have the top of the hill and there's a ball perched right on the top of the hill. It would much rather go down either direction, but right now it's perched precariously because we've built a little structure around it. We've prevented it from rolling. So these lithium ions are trapped. They've got a lot of potential. They want to get out of there. And they've got electrons with them. Also, in a way, trapped in this structure. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to connect our two ends with some sort of resistor. And we have now removed this gate preventing the lithium from rolling. And so once we've uh, created um, this uh, pathway for the electrons to flow, they will be attracted to the positive end with a positive charge. This is a negative charge over here. And so our electrons are going to begin flowing through this circuit. 
losing some of their power through this resistor. And they are going to move to the positive end, their electrons attracted to the positive end. Um, I'm sorry, I actually should have drawn them as blue dots. That's okay, you still get it. So they're attracted over here. Now they need something to pair with, and that is the lithium. So the lithium gave up its electrons, and now it's in such an unstable state that it's able to migrate through this electrolyte and pass back to, in a way, its home, this lithium metal oxide. And it, start, and it inserts itself back into this metal oxide where it's once again happy. And these had a positive charge. These were positively charged ions because they lost an electron. Okay, uh, so that's the basic um, operational principle here. Uh, the lithium travels through the membrane and is then rejoined with the electrons, which go and pair themselves with the lithium once again. Um, the main difference now is we can put instead a power supply across this and we can attract um, the electrons to move the opposite direction. So we're now um, using a voltage potential in this power supply, pulling the electrons out through this power supply and then putting them back over here. The lithium then comes out of the metal oxide structure and wanders back across the membrane where it is stored inside the graphite. And so in a way what we've done is using, so our ball was at the bottom of the hill, we did some work, right? With a voltage potential, a voltage supply, um, an energy source, we pushed this ball back up the hill and then built these gates again, locking the lithium in its place until we remove this voltage supply, reconnect to a circuit and allow those electrons to flow the opposite direction. Okay. Let's talk about a model. Uh, we're not really going to model this much. We're just going to talk about some important characteristics. Um, first, we've heard the word cell a couple times. A cell is a single power generating unit. And a single cell generates about three volts. Okay, you can, of course, put cells in series in order to get higher voltages. This is what you do when you put multiple AA batteries into your clicker or whatever you're putting them into so that you can get a larger operational voltage. Okay, the most important metric of a battery is the amp hour. So the amp hour, which one amp hour is equivalent to having one amp of current leaving the battery. So drawn from the battery for one hour. And after one hour, the battery is depleted. Okay, so a few equations that are helpful here is, remember the power, which is in watts, for a circuit, we can write as the current times the voltage. Like we said, we know the operational voltage of a battery, and for a given amount of amps, for a given current, we know how long that current can be removed from the battery before we run out of power. So in this case, one amp hour means for one amp, we have one hour. Okay. Um, now, energy in watt hours, we can write as voltage times amp hours. So if we want to convert not from power, uh, but energy to amp hours, right? If we want to see how much energy we've actually stored in a battery, we just need to multiply the amp hours by the operational voltage to find the total energy stored inside of the battery. Okay, finally, utilization. Okay, first, lithium ion batteries 
the price of them has dropped 70% only just between the years of 2010 and 2016. Um, so because of that, it now is beginning to make more sense to install lithium ion batteries as grid storage. In fact, we have 450 megawatts of battery storage, specifically lithium ion battery storage which was installed between 2015 and 2017. So this is becoming more popular, but 450 megawatts is not going to do anything for us. We need a vastly, a much larger amount of storage if we're going to um, have a large penetration of renewables. Uh, there are some real problems. Number one, lithium um, is a very light atom with one electron it desperately wants to get rid of which means it reacts very easily. And so it, in fact, is flammable. This is why you hear about lithium ion batteries uh, that go into thermal runaway and catch on fire. So they're flammable. And another trick is lithium, I'm going to say is somewhat rare. That's not necessarily true. Um, but it has very kind of localized mining. So um, from what I understand, current lithium is mostly um, mined in the Andes and kind of these slurry pools that are naturally occurring. It, it's not as easy to find lithium as it is to find nitrogen or oxygen or carbon. It's a little harder to get. And likewise, like you saw, there are other important metals like cobalt and other rare earth metals that we need to make these work. So a massive deployment of lithium ion batteries means we have to drastically increase our mining operations for precious metals, which are in a limited supply. So that is another issue with this battery storage method. Okay, well that's it about batteries. Thanks for watching.